All right, Phil, are we ready to go? This is Lisa. We're all set and we are recording. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Pugh, and I am a co-chair of the Survival Coalition of Wisconsin Disability Organizations. I'm joined by my fellow co-chair of Survival Coalition, Beth Sweeting, who will be speaking later, as well as from people from across Wisconsin. You have joined our press conference about sharing the impacts of COVID-19 on people with disabilities and their family members from across the state. We are showing in our survey results that people with disabilities and their families have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Today, you'll hear a summary of our survey results. You will hear from family members and people with disabilities from across the state. We'll talk about some recommendations and solutions that we hope to see in the biennial budget going forward for people with disabilities. Ultimately, we hope that people with disabilities and their family members really can be a priority in this uh, next biennial budget. So at this time, I would like to turn it over to Beth Swedeen to provide an overview of what we found in our survey. Thanks, Lisa. And uh, for all of you who are watching, um, Phil had sent out a press packet. So there is a summary of the survey results in there, as well as a series of stories collected through the survey. Uh, to give you an overview, we heard from more than 300 people with disabilities and um, their families throughout Wisconsin uh, during a survey that was conducted in December and January. Many, many very compelling stories about what the impacts of COVID have been. Um, the, some of the biggest things have been around the caregiver and direct support crisis, um, which was a problem before the pandemic and the pandemic even uh, further created uh, shortages and crises for families and for people with disabilities. Additionally, um, we heard a lot of stories about social isolation, increased mental health issues. Um, we will go through the results with you section by section, starting um, with what the imp impact has been on employment for people with disabilities. And you can follow along if you have the document in front of you. Um, but basically in that, um, we saw that about a quarter of people with disabilities who were working in the community had their employment supports impacted. Uh, we heard many stories of people who were either not allowed to go to work um, because of their living situation and a fear of the pandemic, or who had to stop work because um, they were worried about risks. So there were many, many impacts on employment as well as the supporters who typically support those people. We also saw um, that about a third of the families who, re who answered the survey um, had some sort of impact on their own employment. Specific to children and families, um, there was, were really some devastating impacts. Um, a th about a third of the families who responded to the survey said they actually lost their jobs during the pandemic. 40% incurred additional debt as a result. And one in eight families of children with disabilities lost their homes. Um, and about a fifth, one in five, lost their health insurance. We're seeing that about a half of the people, over half of the people who responded to the survey are reporting severe depression, isolation, and a need for either mental health or behavioral supports um, to address that issue. So for this population of folks across the, the state, we're really seeing some very significant impacts um, that we are hoping the state budget can address. And so Lisa, you're going to talk a little bit about some of the other findings from the survey. That's right. Um, one thing that I forgot to do in our introduction is to let you know who Survival Coalition is. Um, and just a reminder, Survival Coalition is a cross-disability organization. We've been around for more than 20 years. Um, we have 25 uh, state and local organizations that represent people of all types of disabilities and family members. And our mission is to support people with disabilities of all ages to be 
full participants in their communities. So that's really why we care about these issues. Many of our organizations have direct contact or work with people with disabilities and families. So we heard really from a broad group of people from across the state. And one of the groups that we heard from were a lot of people who responded to the survey were parents of children with disabilities answering our questions around special education. And some of these results were pretty stark in terms of the impact of COVID-19. We had nine in 10 of the family members of children with disabilities of all ages tell us that they had were reporting a negative change in their special education services. Three in four families expected their child to actually have or that were experiencing a skills uh, regression and expected that to continue. As Beth mentioned regarding mental health challenges, two in three were reporting some behavioral challenges of some kind and two in three had expected that their child might lose friendship or critical social connections. In terms of the workforce, this is an issue survival really has been concentrating on through the work of the governor's task force of, on caregiving and in other areas, uh, because there is a critical workforce crisis and scarcity in Wisconsin. And we certainly heard that throughout the survey that uh, nearly half of respondents said that if funding for direct care workers doesn't change, they will need to continue to rely on family members for their unmet needs. So what happened to a lot of people we know is that they might have been living independently with supports and a lot of people had to either they lost those workers for a variety of reasons or they had to move out of their own homes or apartments and their independent living settings to move home with family. 47% um, of family caregivers who completed the survey said that their main concern about the lasting impacts of the pandemic on their family would be a permanent loss of those workers. So nearly half of people responding on workforce questions. As Beth um, referenced in summary around mental health, which we think is one of the biggest impact, even though um, only one in 10 people who responded identified as having a mental health conditions, the negative impact really was shared by a lot of respondents. Over half expressed concerns about a lasting increase in depression, social isolation, and the need for those behavioral and mental health supports. So at this time, and again, the link to the complete survey uh, summary is in the chat, uh, as well as our press release summarizing the results. Uh, we are open for questions afterwards to discuss the results in more detail. But at this time, we would like to hear from people from across the state. The first person we'd like to introduce you to is Andy Thane. Andy is 34 years old. He lives in Thorpe, Wisconsin, which is near the Eau Claire area. Um, Andy has a disability. He uses the IRIS program. Andy, would you please share with us your experience through the pandemic? Okay, I think I'm not muted anymore. Um, so prior to the pandemic, I was managing a staff of two to three um, individuals that would come in to assist with activities of daily living. In addition to that, I also had paid and unpaid supports from family members. So working out schedules, managing around my own needs as well as the needs of uh, the employees who sometimes had second or even third jobs was complicated. Uh, when the pandemic came along, those complexities were compounded. Um, I would often get reports from my staff that two or three of their coworkers from other jobs would be under quarantine and waiting for test results for uh, the uh, COVID uh, uh, virus. And so that created a situation where it was difficult for me to gauge my level of exposure. Uh, how closely did you work with these people? Were you, um, you know, uh, and so a lot of times I would make judgment calls about do I need to take um, people off the schedule or rearrange the schedule or, or uh, mandate that someone goes and gets tested? So all of that added additional complexity uh, to a situation that was already tenuous. Um, I would also run into situations where employees would request time off to go see family members. And this used to be a very routine thing. Uh, but with the pandemic, 
uh, I had to make a judgment call about, um, you know, what my level of exposure was when they came back from a trip. Uh, things like uh, going out to the grocery store or going to doctor's appointments also became things where I had to determine how much risk I was comfortable with. We made all of these decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and um, honestly, I still don't know how many of those were the right call. Uh, in many cases, I would rearrange schedules and ask family members to pick up additional slack in order to uh, minimize my risk. Uh, onboarding new employees uh, is also typically a lengthy and complex process that was also compounded by the pandemic. Um, uh, the nature of the work that my staff does for me is not something that can be done virtually. And so um, interviews were always in person. Uh, and again, taking steps uh, to mitigate those risks um, was important to me. And it takes a while to build trust uh, with new employees and build rapport. Uh, and that uh, on top of the health concerns related uh, to the pandemic was another issue that was uh, top of mind um, during this process. And the pandemic is going to be with us for a while. So these, this is kind of the new normal uh, that I'm working through. My ability to find qualified staff and retain them while minimizing exposure to potential illness has made this complicated and vital system even more challenging. Uh, so with that, I will turn it back over to Beth, I believe. Thank you, Andy, so much. We really appreciate you sharing that. Um, we're going to move on now to another speaker, Beth Mortal. She is a parent of a 24-year-old son in the Milwaukee, in Milwaukee. And um, Beth had to um, kind of put her entire job on hold because Clayton's activities really um, just sort of evaporated during the pandemic. And as a result, he had to change um, Hit the way he was living. And as a result, she needed to pick up more support. So Beth, thank you so much for sharing your story. Hello, um, am I on the screen? Okay, so my name is Beth Mortal and I'm a single mother to my 24 year old son, Clayton Mortal. And we live in the city of Milwaukee. Clayton lives with anxieties, autism and other disabilities. And he uses the IRIS long-term care program. Before the pandemic, Clayton was on the road to independence. He started his days at his job at Quick Trip, and he learned to walk to a local facility, fitness facility, um, close to Quick Trip to go and work out and do some health maintenance. He no longer needed a job coach, and he had grown a lot as a person. He was busy outside of the home with his work and activities for approximately five hours a day. At that time, I was working full time um, from the home and he was, he was gone for five hours. So that gave me that independence to be able to work. Um, this came to a halt in March of last year due to Clayton's immune dysfunction and anxiety. He had to quit his job for two months. He spent his days pacing the floor of our home, um, talking to himself. And I was, could hear this cause I worked in the basement um, I also found out that he had been taking Benadryl regularly because he said he couldn't sleep. Well, he couldn't sleep, but um, so he started to self-medicate, something I was missing. Um, because he was no longer in school and there were no special ed teachers or special ed supports, um, you know, because he's over 18, um, there were really no activities for him. I knew I had to make that difficult decision to quit my job um, to support him. I had been working $50,000 a year job, but I knew that it was the right thing to do um, for his safety. 
I put together a home program for Clayton that kept him busy, and he's still doing this a year later. Um, I was able to find three UWM students to come to the home, help him continue um, doing workouts daily. And he enrolled in UWM online classes. So he started to do that and they would help with um, reading assignments, quizzes, papers um, that he had to write. He takes online theater classes through Pink Umbrella as well, three of those virtually. And he's doing really well with that. And he's also training um, to do voiceover work through them. So for Clayton, this has turned out really well as far as his ability to try new things that he would not have tried um, person to person or out in the community. Virtually, he's been successful. However, um, you know, he's at home. He's not really interacting with a lot of people. So um, I worry about the skills he's lost. I worry about the fact that he and so many other young adults with disabilities lost their community jobs. During this time, we have just been getting by financially. Um, because I quit, I did not get unemployment. Because Clayton quit, he did not get unemployment. I am on Badger Care for health insurance. He's on Medicaid. Um, and we are both on food share. Um, he does take medications and supplements. He still doesn't really sleep well, but at least I can watch over and um, be there to support him. I fear the ongoing impacts of isolation, anxiety, depression. Um, there really are not any safety nets for our families. School-aged children, you know, they still have their schools um, staff to support them and their families get a break. At this point, um, you know, we're getting through day by day. Things are good, but I do worry about long-term mental health effects as I have noticed he's um, uh, more withdrawn, more set uh, in you know things being a specific way or he gets anxiety. So we're working through that and thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Beth, for sharing your story as well. Our final speaker uh, could not be with us in person today live because um, she had a, a training um, conflict with her job. Her name is Shannon Mattox and she is from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She is a single mom of two sons. One is in college and one is a 10 year old who has been uh, home and virtually learning since March. Um, Shannon had additional um, stresses. She, lost, she had to put her small business on hold. She had to reduce her hours to support her son. And on top of it, um, she lost her mother during the pandemic, um, who was a resident of a long-term care facility. So now we're going to share Shannon's story. Hello, my name is Shannon Fashola Mattox. I am born and raised um, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm the proud mother of two sons. One son is a senior in college, majoring in engineering at an HBCU. I also am the proud mother of a brilliantly unique son who has multiple disabilities and is 10 years old and a student at Milwaukee Public Schools. Um, my 10 year old son is bravely trying his very best to get through this pandemic as we all are, my entire family and we all are across the country, across the world actually. Um, my 10 year old son asked me every single day, mommy, mommy, is coronavirus over yet? Mommy, is coronavirus over yet? And I respond, not yet. We're all hoping that it'll be over pretty soon. At times he says to me that he's lonely, <clears throat> Um, for a very long time, he was happy to be home, but he really misses school now. He misses his teacher. He misses his friends. He misses the activities that he once had or that he was used to going to. Um, one of his first loves was swimming, um, besides me, <laughs> his first love was swimming. Um, and uh, he's not unable to go there. Um, it's open, but I don't trust it. Um, I'd rather him be safe. Um, then get sick. So we've um, eliminated swimming from him. Um, and he really misses that. He learned to swim and had been doing that for years and he doesn't go there anymore. 
Um, he has a number of therapies that um, he's been doing virtually since we've been in pandemic since March. Um, all of those have been virtual. Uh, recently, he's uh, resumed his yoga therapy occasionally, um, but not always. He does miss those quite a bit. Um, in school, um, he's on the virtual platform as the rest of the kids have been for the most part with MPS and um, he has digressed some in, my, in math. Um, he is, although he has disabilities, he's a very, very, very intelligent child and is in a general uh, curriculum, but he has digressed some in, in, in math as a result of being um, home with school. Um, due to his disabilities, um, it would be more optimal for him to have social interaction. Um, so, um, you know, this is, is having an effect on him. And my son is also expressing that he now grieves the loss of my mother, which is another thing that I would like to discuss here today. Three years ago, my mother at around the age of 66 um, was diagnosed with the early stages of dementia and cancer and um, was put in a long-term care uh, home where she contracted, also contracted COVID-19 uh, from one, one of the personal care workers there. And, um, had it for like two months, beat COVID, um, but her, her condition was never the same. Her condition actually deteriorated as, as a result. My mother became very lonely. Um, she was in the hospital, unable to speak or communicate with her family, un unable to see anyone, much like the stories we've all, all heard about people with COVID. When she got back to her long-term care, um, home, um, she could not see any of us. Um, in June, um, we were able to, I was able to bring her outside to start visiting her outside, but I, I couldn't really touch her. Um, my mother cried because she could not understand when we would do window visits why I could not see her. It broke my heart. Um, so we had an unseasonably, unseasonably warm fall. Through November 15th, about November 15th, I was able to visit my mother outside, but I knew that my mother would get very sad and very depressed. And as I sort of prophesied, that did happen. My mother gave up, had a stroke, stopped eating, and went to the ancestor realm. Um, on winter solstice, um, December 21st, my mother went to heaven. And um, my son is now expressing my whole family um, is grieving the loss of my mother um, and my son um, with disabilities um, is saying that he's grieving the loss of my mother. Um, so um, in addition to all of these other things, I um, had a small business prior to pandemic. Um, I did work as a substitute teacher um, in addition to my small business, um, prior to that, I had a career in non-for-profit, but because of the needs of my son, um, I transitioned to being a substitute teacher and um, work doing the small business to be there for my son, but I, I could no longer work as a substitute teacher. I could no longer do my small business because it was not safe. And also, I needed to be at home with my son all day long to teach him to, to uh, help the teacher teach him at home because who else was going to be home with my son? I'm a single mom. Um, I did not know where my money was gonna come from because I'm the sole provider. I have a son in college. I had an ailing mother. I had my son at home all day. Um, there was a CLTS program that was helpful in some ways um, in Milwaukee County across the state, uh, which is why I think that um, the state should make sure that that program stays in place and that, that that funding for that program should be increased and that more families should know about that and there should continue to be no barriers whatsoever for families with that program. I don't think that there should be any barriers whatsoever for any families with any programs or any services, especially in, in communities like Milwaukee where there are already huge gaps, period. No person should be told that there are any barriers when they go to receive any services whatsoever. Any barriers. They shouldn't be told, have you lost, asked if you have you lost your job because of COVID or anything. If you need services, here they are. Um, 
getting a little bit beside myself, but yes. Um, so yes, um, there was loss of income in my household due to the, to the pandemic. There were loss of resources in my household due to the pandemic. Um, un, uh, much like other families um, across our, our, our country, um, there, were there, were, there were loss of many things, but my family is tough. Um, we persevered through a lot over the years, um, many things. Uh, it became mentally exhausting. It became physically exhausting. And um, again, we just kept going. Um, the greatest loss again that we suffered is the loss of our matriarch, is the loss of my mother. So the one thing that I would like to ask the state of Wisconsin to do, because my family has suffered so much and so many other families in our community and people in our community um, in the disability community and in, in, in communities of color and just com in, in co communities across our state have suffered is to the least that you can do is to make sure that there is funding for the services that are needed to make sure that we come out on the other side of this um, better than we even came into it. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for sharing their stories today. Thank you to Andy and Beth and Shannon. As you can tell by listening to these um, compelling stories that survey results are really showing the very dire impact of COVID-19 on people with disabilities and families across the state. Uh, part of our goal in sharing these stories was to help our elected officials uh, see the areas of need and to ensure that as our biennial budget document is crafted and that funding priorities are considered, that there needs to be increased funding and supports for students with disabilities, support for the recommendations in the Governor's Task Force on caregiving to address the direct care workforce, investments in mental health and behavioral supports and supports for family caregivers um, of, of people with disabilities of all ages. So um, for anybody who's been listening uh, in the chat, you will see the press release the survey results and a summary of stories uh, that is linked there. If you need that sent to you, please uh, contact Survival Coalition after this event. Um, and know that we can connect you with survey respondents who might be from your part of the state to better understand what's happening locally. Um, in addition, uh, regarding the budget this week, um, Governor Evers did release some announcements about things that he will be including in his budget proposal that the Survival Coalition does support. Um, this week, the governor did announce a $600 million investment in family caregiver and direct care workforce supports that will address uh, some issues that certainly you've heard about today that and that were reflected in the survey with regard to the uh, need to invest more in programs to allow us to pay direct care workers more. Uh, average wage of direct care workers is between $10 and $11 an hour, and it's really hard to attract and keep good workers. Turnover of paid direct care workforce is somewhere around 50%. Um, so the governor's recommendations that we hope will receive bipartisan support in the legislature include um, a re-evaluation re of the rates paid through the family care and IRIS systems to ensure that providers can and individuals can receive funding to support paying workers a better wage. There's also recommendations in there rela in related to the ability to access other benefits um, for direct care workers so that they not only can earn a wage to support their families, but that they can have, for instance, access to child care for their own children. Uh, we also support, of course, increases in special education funding and behavioral and mental health supports in schools, as well as the governor's proposed investments in um, mental health that were announced also this week. Um, 
Family caregivers also need supports, family caregivers of all types. Uh, we support investments in the aging and disability resource centers that can expand their um, support to caregivers of all ages, as well as investments, as you heard Shannon talk about, in the children's system and uh, children disability resource centers uh, that can help families access better information and supports in the children's long-term support system. So thank you again for listening to our survey summary and for listening to the families. Uh, we thank our families for sharing their stories. And at this time, we would like to open up the event for any questions from members of the media. Bill, are you able to unmute people or? I am, I'm doing that now. Okay. Are there any questions? There's still some people that are muted. Yeah, they have the ability to um, unmute themselves at this point. Oh, okay. Well, it, so, it seems as if uh, perhaps we don't have any questions. Uh, so maybe we answered everyone's questions in our event today. We thank you again for attending, for um, reading through our uh, survey results and from hearing from people from across the state today. Just a reminder that if you'd like to be connected with somebody locally who participated in the Survival Coalition survey that um, we are um, very happy to do that. And you uh, should email and connect with Survival Coalition after this event. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. So I don't know, Phil and Beth, if you wanna stick on for a sec. Thanks Beth. Thanks, to Thanks Bye. We I'm appreciate trying, it. I'm trying to get out. <laughs> oh, no, no problem. worries. <laughs> we're pushing you out. <laughs>